thank you very much for coming out tonight. I appreciate it's been an extremely difficult day with the strikes, and this is really far more people than we were expecting, so it's lovely to see you all. And I'm really going to start by telling you what this is not a lecture about, which is a bit strange, I guess. Um, it is not a lecture about the history of the use of the potter's wheel in the Bronze Age Aegean, nor is it a lecture exclusively about conical cups, which should be a relief to most of you, to be honest. So what I want to share instead is an overview of the aims and the methods of our Tracing the Potter's Wheel project, which I hope will contextualize the exhibition that we have set up upstairs and to give you a little bit more insight into some of the preliminary research that we've been carrying out and some of our recently emerging outputs. So yes, there will be drinks after this talk, but we would very much like you to watch a little video upstairs first and have a bit of a look around the exhibition before we uh, bring alcohol into the picture. <laughs> so yes, I would also like to say a very heartfelt Thank you to all of the, uh, the colleagues and our friends at NIA. Um, their generosity and assistance in helping us to put this exhibition together has been immense, and we are extremely grateful to Winfred, the director, Emmy, the uh, secretary, Yanni, the building manager, as well as Panagioti and Galina. And so, yes, I will now kick off the presentation. So, the full title of our project is Tracing the Potter's Wheel, Investigating Technological Trajectories and Cultural Encounters in the Bronze Age Aegean. As Winfred mentioned, it is part of the Dutch Institute for Scientific Research's national grant system, the VD project, and it's based at the Amsterdam Center for Ancient Studies and Archaeology, known as ACASA, and that's hosted at the University of Amsterdam and shared with the Vrij Universiteit in Amsterdam as well. And he also did me the favor of introducing my team, but I'm going to do it again anyway, because this really has been an immense team effort, this exhibition, and I think it's only fair to give credit where credit is due. And Luce and Caroline and myself have had a bit of a journey, let's be honest. This is our first time doing an exhibition, and it's been a real eye-opener, but it's been very rewarding as well, so, indeed. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of the project's outline and its aims, and then take you through the briefest of summaries in terms of the techniques that the three of us inside the team use in our research, I'm going to talk a little bit about the wheel and the case study of Akrotiri. And then I will go on to talk a bit more about our exhibition upstairs, the online resources that the project has been developing, and then a little bit of a snippet as to what we're planning for the future. And, uh, and we hope that it involves quite a few of you. So that's very exciting. So tracing the potter's wheel uses three distinct but interdependent research techniques which include compositional or fabric characterization, forming technology analysis, and 3D scanning and visualization. These techniques are integrated within the project framework to achieve two primary goals. We want to provide high quality resources and standardized guidelines for researchers to learn how to technologically assess assemblages in their own research and also to broadly define the nature of the uptake and use of the pottery wheel in the Aegean during the late Bronze Age. So the team represents three core strengths that we bring into the project. Um, one is compositional analysis using macroscopic hand specimen study of shared material and following that up with petrographic and subsequent chemical analysis where needed. Caroline is the experimental archaeologist and has been creating an experimental typeset that allows her to look at correlations of surface features between archaeological material and her own experimental typeset. And Luce is our digital archaeologist who is responsible for the 3D scanning and the generation of models of our experimental data set, which we hope will form the touchstone of our reference collection. 
And really, just the briefest of summaries about why the wheel is such an interesting technology to look into. And I really don't have to sell it very hard looking at the faces in this room. It, it's a very popular subject and it's been looked into with increasing uh, systematic rigor in the last 10 years. There are two very broad traditional narratives for how wheel use first appears in the Aegean and I've tried to summarize these in this map. The earlier horizon around the end of the early Bronze Age, particularly the AB2, is very much in association with metals, trade, increasing and coming from the east, whilst the later horizon of wheel use is primarily associated with Crete and the Minoan culture and the spread of that technology as part of the Minoanization package of, uh, of knowledge, basically. And a very important part of our TPW techniques is this generation of workflows. We are very much looking to create standardization in our work practices to be able to communicate them to other scholars who are interested in carrying out this type of work in their own assemblages. Because I think the key thing to mention here is that even though there are three of us, physically going and carrying out primary study of the assemblages that should be taken into consideration to build up a broader narrative of the wheel is simply too much, too great. And what we would like to do is to allow a sort of more uh, interactive or peer-led process of data generation that can come together and create, hopefully, what will be a much more detailed picture of this technology. So ceramic technology, it's, um, yeah, it's often very difficult to explain to people about technological issues because it is such potentially a, a static concept in books and in exhibitions when in actual fact it's really dealing with the very dynamics of the way that people interacted with each other in the past. The central questions for ceramic technology are really focused on issues of composition as well as processing and forming techniques. And these are really crucial for identifying the technical or technological choices being made by potters in the past. And we call these choices the stages of the chaîne opératoire or the production sequence. And everything that our project is doing is trying very hard to be explicit about where we link into that production sequence for pottery. The compositional analysis of ceramic fabrics can identify the types of raw materials used in the production of a particular vessel or ware, or indeed an entire ceramic assemblage. This in turn facilitates the characterization of the technological choices employed by the potter in the raw material acquisition, paste processing, and even sometimes forming technique. It's important to establish whether vessels are locally produced or imported when found within an assemblage deposit. And this is because technology used for imported vessels does not necessarily indicate or imply the use of that technology at the site where the vessel was found. The integration of compositional and textural information at the macroscopic, the petrographic microscope, and also the elemental or mineralogical chemical level really provides the most effective means of characterizing these ceramic fabrics and we need to compare them to the raw materials in the landscape. It's only through analyzing locally collected geological sediments, experimental briquettes made from those sediments, and the archeological ceramics side by side that we can really begin to indicate the specific technical choices made by ancient potters. The choice of forming technique for ceramic vessels is one stage of the chaîne opératoire in which social phenomena play a very significant role. And this is due to the concept of salience within pottery making techniques. The choice of a potter to hand build a vessel or to use a wheel to finish a hand built rough out or even to shape a lump of clay on a wheel into a vessel. It's not known to the distributor or the user of that vessel. 
further still, the tools and the gestures required to perform each part of that forming technique also remain a mystery if you're only looking at the finished pot itself. So forming techniques represent knowledge that is not transmittable in the finished object, but must be transmitted person to person. Experimental archaeology, then, is able to engage with the identification of forming techniques by reconstructing the sequence of actions that leave diagnostic macro traces on the surfaces of the ceramic vessels. The use of rotative kinetic energy, or RKE, in the form of a tournet or a weighted wheel device, leaves very distinctive traces on the surface of a pot, such as rilling. If a hand-built coiled rough-out of a vessel is finished on a wheel, then other subsequent diagnostic traces can form that reveal the initial coiled structure in combination with the rotative kinetic energy, such as S-cracks or tension seams. Repetition, then, is embedded in the experimental process because it is erroneous to assume that the full range of potential diagnostic features will always be present on each experimentally produced vessel. In practice, the strength of the experimental approach for identifying and tracing the transmission of the potter's wheel is in the greater detail accessible in discussing these production sequences diachronically. Reconstruction of ceramic chaine opératoire in use within a ceramic assemblage at a particular site forms the empirical foundation for investigating the variation within local pottery producing communities, allowing subsequently broader regional and temporal differences to be identified. However, communicating technological change at these scales or even at the micro scale of a single site has always been a difficult task for archaeologists. Luckily, new visual technologies such as 3D scanning and modeling offer huge potential for enhancing research strategies that can promote ancient technological studies for contemporary society. As with the experimental and the fabric analysis components, visualization draws upon the chaine opératoire, chaine opératoire approach to structure the process of acquiring data and interpreting the results. In many ways, the digital archaeologist develops a workflow that actually mirrors an ancient craftsperson's chaîne opératoire of technical tasks, although the end product is, of course, somewhat different. Whereas a potter produces a tangible fired clay vessel, the digital archaeologist produces a virtual high-resolution model of a fired clay vessel that can be rotated and manipulated by the viewer at will. As always, close collaboration is required between the analyst, the experimenter, and the visualizer, because a clear understanding of what is technologically important is required. In other words, what needs to be visualized and to what resolution? In the case of wheel-made pottery, the distinctive surface traces made by RKE must be visible to the viewer alongside more traditional views of the shape profile and the location of those traces on the vessel itself. Replication of the 3D scanning process is also essential if other specialists are to add their compatible models to an open access database of diagnostic wheel traces. The creation or following of technical manuals is also an important step in the digital archaeologist's workflow. And this allows archaeological specialists to build a detailed, annotated online reference collection for the identification of wheel traces in their own assemblages. On the other hand, an open access data repository also allows non-specialists to follow the questions and the methods and the practices of specialist archaeologists by accessing that data set virtually, manipulating the scale and angle of models, and asking their own questions of the material that they can access online. And this is a significant step forward towards challenging traditional perceptions of ancient artifact and technological research as being rather static in archaeology, both in terms of its presentation and also understanding for the general public. Tracing the potter's wheel in the Bronze Age Aegean really, for us, 
carries with it this sort of ization phenomenon that reoccur seemingly again and again in this region. And whether it's Anatolianization or Minoanization or Mycenaeanization, these terms all carry tacit indications of cultural contact, tentatively balancing between a description of how and an explanation of why changes in the material record are driven by hierarchical interactions between different sociocultural groups. The technological dimension of these interactions, of these cultural encounters, is a field that's very much ripe for further study. And the potter's wheel in particular provides common ground for investigating millennia of prehistoric interactions in the Aegean. The traditional narrative for the innovation of the potter's wheel is a simple linear explanation that correlates the emergence of wheel throwing, so that's a lump of clay on a wheel used uh, and throwing the shape. It correlates the emergence of wheel throwing to growing populations and social complexity that demanded routinized increased production of ceramic products. However, Recent work supports that the first use of the potter's wheel in the Near East and the Aegean regions was actually a finishing stage for hand-built preformed roughouts. <coughs> These roughouts are made by stacking hand-rolled ro hand coils of clay. I'm going to give you a little bit of an insight, but I want to show you a picture of these coils first. There we go. So the potter's wheel is then used to thin, shape, and finish the coiled walls, actions that require increasing amounts of rotative kinetic energy. This means that we should see wheel coiling as an intermediate or combination potting strategy, effectively bridging hand building and wheel throwing as we know it today. This distinction is really important for considering how the potter's wheel spread throughout the potting communities in the Aegean. Within the Bronze Age of this region, the appearance of the wheel was considered as two potentially independent events, just as the earlier map with the red and the blue arrows. The earliest horizon of vessels showing wheel use appears during the later Early Bronze II period, known as the Lethkandi I or Castri phase ceramically. And here, the potter's wheel is known to have already been in use via these Western Anatolian trade networks primarily in use on Anatolia. The vessels of this phase are accordingly known as Anatolianizing shapes, reflecting close parallels to existing early bronze vessels from Western Anatolian sites such as Limantepe, Cheshme, and Troy. In the later transition from the Middle Bronze to the Late Bronze period, the potter's wheel is considered as a technology of the Minoan cultures of Crete. The potter's wheel spread beyond the borders of Crete then as part of this package of technologies that attest to growing Minoan power and influence. Diagnostic traces of wheel use within Cretan and off-island, non-Cretan but Minoanized ceramic assemblages of the Middle Bronze III to Late Bronze I have been recently reassessed and show that wheel coiling continues to dominate the ceramic record. This would indicate that wheel throwing was not an innovation linked to this transitional phase. Instead, wheel thrown pottery is probably a later technological development in the Aegean. <coughs> this transition from wheel coiling to wheel throwing is fairly poorly understood within Aegean archeology span and beyond. And this is exacerbated by the fact that few ceramic assemblages offer the stratigraphic continuity to be able to trace this technology right from the earliest through to the end of the latest um, phenomena. Stratigraphic continuity is essential for identifying and mapping the modification of this technique within the Chêne Peritoire. One Bronze Age site in particular has afforded particularly the Tracing the Potter's Wheel team, a closer look at the dynamics of technological change within ceramic manufacture. Akrotiri, the exceptionally preserved site on Thera, was buried under thick layers of pumice during a catastrophic volcanic eruption towards the end of the 17th century BC. 
Ceramic material recovered from the excavations at Akrotiri has revealed a complex local ceramic tradition in the millennia preceding the eruption. The diachronic nature of the Akrotiri dataset provides an excellent platform from which to investigate processes of Minoanization. By focusing on the mid to later phases of the Middle Bronze Age sequence, approximately 1950 to 1700 BC, um, distinguished by the arrival of Minoan stylistic and technological features, wheel coiled vessels, we can reconstruct a detailed understanding of what is inherently local versus Minoanized at Akrotiri. And this picture gives a very good sense about this interplay of variation going on within the assemblage. We see actual imports coming probably from north central Crete, most likely Knossos, appearing alongside a thriving local ceramic tradition. So the local cycladic piriform cup shape with a naturalistic motif, which is not particularly common on Crete in this period. And then we see the arrival of this, which maintains the local shape and yet switches to the aesthetic of the Minoan white on dark painted pots. And even though they've used the white dots, they couldn't help but create a potentially more naturalistic motif with their painted decoration. This type of visual copying doesn't necessarily indicate personal one-on-one -on -one social interactions between craft specialists. It could very much have been generated by short-term visual copying from looking at a finished vessel. The compositional and textual analyses of archaeological vessels and geological sediments from Akrotiri was carried out in tandem with surface macrotrace analysis to be able to characterize the fabrics of the assemblage in phases B and C. Using this information, the chaîne opératoire for each of the wares at Thera was identified and then compared across a range of local Theran and non-local or Minoanized shapes to be able to reconstruct the practices of local potters. Through this integrated analysis program, we were able to assess whether shared practices as a community at Akrotiri differed over time in response to changing interactions with the Minoan world. For the wheel finished Minoanized vessels analyzed at Akrotiri, such as the ledger in bowl, there seems to have been little attempt to refine the clay paste in imitation of the fine grained fabrics of contemporary <coughs> Minoan imports. Instead, these bowls were manufactured using locally compatible raw materials that showed little to no paste processing, effectively presenting the same production sequence as the local handmade pots and therefore the same technical decisions as the local clay recipe. It would seem then that the first use of wheel technology at Akrotiri was very much firmly integrated within the local tradition, rooted from the earliest stages of the production sequence. From this knowledge, we can interpret that local potters at Akrotiri had sustained contact with Minoan potters, allowing them to learn the wheel technique which they then incorporated into their own potting traditions. This type of interpretation does not suggest political dominance by Crete, the old fashioned way of thinking about Minoanization. Instead, it seems that potters at Akrotiri and the people that they were making these pots for actively chose to participate within certain Minoan ritual practices that required specific shapes, such as the ledger in bowl, for which deliberate formation techniques were used to enhance the intrinsic value of these novel artifacts. A strong local cycladic tradition of pottery production was maintained, and with it, a well-defined non-Cretan community identity within the settlement of Akrotiri. In tandem with the scientific analysis of ceramics, a systematic program of experiments was carried out to explore the wider material evidence both products and tools for wheel coiling and wheel throwing in the Bronze Age Aegean. <coughs> a ceramic typeset designed to act as an analog for the wide range of vessels corresponding to the Aegean Bronze Age was created by Caroline Jeffra in order to improve our ability to differentiate between specific wheel use strategies through their macro traces. And this in turn facilitates a deeper investigation of the relationship between 
these different techniques. Three primary variables were considered, vessel shape, forming technique, and clay type, by which we talk about degree of coarseness. The macro trace results of the experimental type set were then applied to the study of archaeological material, consisting of key diachronic assemblages recovered from across the Aegean, including the later Middle Bronze Aquitiri assemblage. The sequence of study described here is crucial because the experimental type set allows us to first establish the range of diagnostic traces associated with specific wheel forming techniques. Following this, the traces on the Aegean material can be recognized as relating to one form of wheel forming or another. The investigation at Middle Bronze Age Aquitiri illustrates how we can assemble increasingly precise information about the practices and interconnections between communities of craftspeople. For example, small vessels were found to correspond with one of two different forming techniques, hand building or wheel coiling. Conical cups, straight-sided cups and hemispherical cups, shapes all associated with Crete, were all wheel coiled. Ledge rim bowls, also associated with Crete, were mostly wheel coiled, but also made by hand atop a woven mat. And lastly, locally derived cycladic cups were almost exclusively handmade, with just two examples which were wheel coiled. Emerging from this is a picture of technical negotiation, where shapes typical of Crete, as well as shapes typical of Akrotiri and her other cycladic neighbors, were formed using wheel coiling alongside some cases of hand building as well. In this way, the experimentally derived data sets support the presence of a network of communication between craftspeople on Akrotiri, forming cycladic cups, and Crete, forming the other shapes through which the transmission of the potter's wheel technique took place. So far, the technical details that suggest shared craft networks between Crete and the cycladic community of Akrotiri are only visible and therefore accessible to archaeological specialists with the privilege to work at this site. And it was very much in this vein that we decided that we would like to open up the research that we were doing and the methods that we've been using to allow other people to be able to apply this method to looking into their own assemblages. And also to use the full potential of the 3D techniques to really open up this research to members of the general public, complete non-specialists in looking at ceramic technology. So the Tracing the Conical Cup exhibition is really one tiny little element of our research that's ongoing and how we are trying to speak to people and communicate the results that we've been finding. People have been making the humble cup for thousands of years, whittling them from wood or bone, casting them in metal, or shaping them from clay. However, what's exciting for archaeologists is that the plastic cups of today have a strong connection with ceramic cups in prehistory. All of that variation that we just saw at Akrotiri for these small cup shapes can be... Uh, and have a sort of parallel with modern production of small cup shapes today. The conical cup is potentially an odd item to choose to focus on for an entire exhibition. It's often the butt of archaeological jokes because it's always small and plain and handleless and, and sometimes pretty crappily made. It's often known as crude ware or coarse ware and you can really really struggle to imagine why somebody would have actually chosen to fire that object in the first place. These little cups are often about four to six centimeters in height, four centimeters across the base, and nine centimeters at the rim, and have usually a capacity of somewhere between 100 and 180 milliliters. And they're also found in large quantities. And because they're not finely finished or decorated, they have these obvious manufacturing traces left embedded in their surfaces. They first appear within protopalatial deposits on Crete around 1950 BC and can be found right into the final palatial phases. And despite their plain featureless design, 
they also begin to appear at archaeological sites far from the Cretan palaces of the Minoan culture. So what made these cups so popular? And how can archaeologists such as the TPW team and others in the Aegean even begin to address this question? There is no doubt that wheel use traditionally has always been bound up with notions of standardization within ceramic production, increased routinization leading to greater economy and pressure to invest less time and effort into making each pot. However, as recent research is now coming to light by many people in this room, um, we know that the provenance and technology of conical cups demands a reassessment from these earlier models of Minoan presence in the Aegean. Detailed technological studies, such as the ones I've outlined tonight, that focus on fabric analysis and forming techniques suggest that cycladic communities, and not just Adacoteri, but also Philacopi and Iorini as well, chose which aspects of Minoan society to imitate and participate in. And theirs was really not a slavish attempt to become Minoan, but rather, according to Karl Nappet and Irini Nikolakopoulou, it was instead a deliberate, selective process of emulation engaged in strategically by local communities. So if conical cups are neither the material expression of population pressure nor an imposed Minoan practice, how can we better explain them? Well, off-island communities first emulated Minoan cultural traits through the most iconic of Minoan artifacts, the one produced in its thousands, these conical cups. This fact could actually be key to the rapid adoption of plain handleless vessels across the Aegean. The iconic status of the conical cup may have been just as desirable or powerful an indicator of Minoan identity in the later Bronze Age as it is today for Aegean archaeologists. Highly recognizable, highly distinctive, and bound up with all of these practices. Yet the transition, transmission and adoption of the conical cup package seems to transcend different types of interactions. It simultaneously appears across Crete and at numerous sites off the island of Crete itself. And furthermore, because the conical cup signifies the nascent use of the potter's wheel at many Aegean sites, though it probably appeared much earlier in Anatolia, transmission of which is assumed to have taken place through intensive social engagement between potting communities and not the intermittent, brief, low-intensity contact that visual copying suggests. So the exhibition upstairs is really a chance for us to show how we are approaching the visualization of this forming technology, how we are looking into these small conical cups as ciphers of social interactions. And we're also drawing upon the idea that ceramics were very much the plastic of the past and the impact of that in modern society. So the Tracing the Conical Cup exhibition is also slightly interactive. We invite you to uh, take a closer look at some of these objects upstairs and see if you can gain a different way of understanding or appreciating a lot of these technological features. The exhibition was also uh, set up at uh, the invitation of the Heraklion Archaeological Museum as part of their Daedalos exhibition, which is running until the end of March next year. And this exhibition uses the mythical craftsperson of Daedalus to really explain to the general public how a range of technological processes developed throughout the Bronze Age uh, in the Aegean, such as stone vessel formation, woodworking, ceramic production, metal production. It's a really fascinating assemblage and a really fascinating exhibition, and I highly recommend it to everybody. We generated a significant number of online resources as companions to our exhibition in the museum. We did this mainly through our working project website, um, tracingthewheel.eu, and we also have a public outreach page through Facebook where people can interact and send comments and questions. On our website, we have the project blog, which really hopes to 
address some of the more detailed questions and some of the basic principles of these techniques for both specialists and non-specialists alike. You can go in and you can read about particular facets of our work. And that covers both the compositional analysis, the experimental component, and the 3D processes. We've also created a series of videos because really all these dynamic actions can really best be communicated by physically watching. It doesn't necessarily mean that you can make a pot on your own. We know that actually requires one-on-one -on -one contact, but at least it helps people to understand the physicality of the process, the length of time, and what could potentially go wrong. And we're also building up an ongoing collection of our 3D models from our experimental collection on Sketchfab, which is a wonderful environment that allows us to tag and annotate our models and create a series of learning pathways to allow people to ask their own questions of these 3D models. You can also take them and print them out yourself if you have a 3D printer. And so all of this brings me to our, our final section. And really, in tandem with our primary research on sites of the Aegean Bronze Age, the TPW team is seeking to provide these high quality resources and standardized guidelines for researchers to learn how to technologically assess ceramic assemblages in their own research in all periods and regions in which the potter's wheel was a viable technology. Our integrated approach has generated really detailed data sets that have not been traditionally been presented or archived in an integrated way. Yet it's probably only through integration of these data sets in a purpose-built database environment that a new, deeper understanding of these technologies and their development can be shared. The Tracing the Potter's Wheel database will facilitate comparative research by providing a clear visual platform for the identification of wheel traces and establishing an effective workflow for data collection and management. This is really achieved in two ways. The designing of learning pathways within the database for wheel trace identification that will structure specific learning aims for the archaeologists and the specialists and also the publication on our website of open access training manuals for the core techniques that we use for our data collection. Controlled light photography, photomicrographs, and structured light scanning. The manuals include guidelines for file export to sustainable file types and hope to create a more accessible and standardized data environment for all specialists researching technological change in transmission. The development of a toolkit for the wider archaeological community is necessary so specialists may replicate integrated methods and practices and generate a larger number of compatible data sets that can then be brought into a collective interpretation of this technological phenomenon of the potter's wheel. By building up from the foundational strengths of the Chen Operatoire and explicitly sharing a workflow practice, a common lexicon of terms for wheel use within ceramic production and its study can be established. The benefits are twofold. Interested non-specialists are able to acquire expertise and directly access the tools to gain competence, and active specialists are able to contribute their data and findings seamlessly into the data environment. Given that ancient technologies pose large-scale regional and diachronic questions, Fostering participation with peers and the integration of data from different scholars and research teams seems really important. Just as the wheel was introduced into the existing chaîne opératoire of ceramic production, primarily as a bridging technique, the 3D scanner has been introduced to the archaeologist's toolkit, effectively bridging the representations of hand-drawn images and the realism of photographic techniques. And this idea of a tradition in transition not only forms the core of Luce's PhD, but also forms a common thread for the analysis of technological innovation in the past and present practice. Thank you.